Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. One of the things that is the most fun in my day is getting to talk with really smart people who research the facts behind almost everything in Hawaii and come up with great solutions. Leading the team at the Grassroot Institute is Joe Kent, the vice president of research, whose job it is to see that the best available research from across the country and the world is used to apply to the problems that we face in Hawaii and the economy and government government and society, and used to come up with great solutions. And uh, I have to tell you, that's a lot of fun and brings us in contact with some very creative people. Today we're going to talk with Joe, who is a former resident and a former employee on the island of Maui. Uh, he learned in that county, Maui County, which consists of three islands, what it's like to live in an island environment uh, that is somewhat small, but somewhat big in terms of its potential impact upon the entire state and perhaps even the world. And today's episode is called Here Today, Gone to Maui. We're going to take a look at how public policy can learn quite a bit by looking at what's going on on the island of Maui. So I welcome to the program today, Joe. Joe Kent, aloha. Welcome to the program today. Aloha. Thanks so much for having me. Well, you know, this seems so in-house. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because you actually helped me put together our guests, our mm -hmm. programs, and, and get the research that's behind them. And, and I appreciate that greatly. But as you and I have talked, Maui is a very special place, not only right. because of the beauty, the people, the, the, the wonderful culture that is over there. Maui's special because those of us in the policy world who come up with good policies can learn quite a bit from Maui. Right. I mean, I, I used to, I've lived on Maui for uh, many years, mm -hmm. and when I was there, my friends would say, oh, why get involved uh, with all the all this stuff, the economics, uh, society, and government? Why, why should you care? Maui can't make a difference. But the reality is Maui is big when it comes to making a difference in the state. All the biggest issues across the state are happening uh, on Maui right now. And it serves as kind of a tipping point for, so, ma for much, so much of the rest of the state. In a sense, Maui is a microcosm of the rest of the state when it comes to what's going on in issues related to the economy or to society at large or, or to the government. Right. In some ways, it's small enough so that we can do things and mm -hmm. actually change policy and, and change society for the better, but it's big enough be that it can have an impact right. and be somewhat of an incubator for policy solutions. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a, a cross between, uh, it's, you know, it's rural like the big island, but it's also a little bit of a big city as well, and so you've just got this perfect mix that serves as a... Uh, um, the perfect catalyst for a lot of issues. Absolutely. So. Well, one of those issues that we have been tracking and getting involved in and have become uh, very much committed to bringing out about a good solution has been the public-private partnership of Maui's public hospital system. And right. you've been there from the very beginning with us. Uh, in many ways, this issue is really bigger than just three little hospitals on, on the island of Maui mm -hmm. or their employees. Uh, this issue could become a pattern for how on island after island we handle not only the labor at hospitals, but perhaps in other sectors of government mm -hmm. and so That's forth. Right. And tell us a little bit about what actually generated our interest in the Maui hospital situation. Right. Well, I mean, I, I remember being sick one time on Maui, uh -huh. and uh, I had to go all the way to the other side of the island just to get to the hospital. And I was thinking, why is it so hard to find a doctor uh, on Maui? And a lot of people on all the other islands say the same thing. Why is it so hard to find a doctor? Well, the reason is because of government management of a lot of the, uh, the hospital sector. And that has created um, less, less supply for a big demand. And when we saw at the legislature that there was this move to uh, create a partnership between a private entity that would help to run and manage the hospital, we, uh, we jumped on board, we did some research, and we found that this could really save a lot of money. In fact, looking at some of the causes of the problem, you helped do some of the research that showed that ultimately the state hospital system it was really functionally bankrupt. Right. I, right. In a normal business, mm -hmm. if you bring in less money than you spend, you, you end up with a situation that, that, that puts you ultimately into going out of business. Mm -hmm. But this was actually masked right. by the fact that year after year, 
the hospital system would come to the state legislature and our state legislators would pour money into it, uh, up to $100 million a year, right. which hid that fact. Now, what were some of the reasons, or perhaps one of the main causes, that this hospital system run by the state was going bankrupt functionally? Well, one of the big reasons is overhead for bureaucracy. And you'll find a lot of times in government systems, bureaucracy costs more. Because if there is uh, someone who's going to bail them out, as long as there's some free money, then the cost goes up to take advantage of that free money. And the more money they were pouring in, the higher costs would rise every time. And this created a, a system where it was you know, functionally bankrupt. Sure. A lot of systems don't realize that institutions, you know, you see the building. You see the ambulance, you see the doctors, but what you don't see is the debt that's behind it, that every year they have to limp to the legislature to say, could we have you know, $100 million? Now, a huge part of that cost, as you pointed out in your report, had to do with the cost of labor. Mm -hmm. That uh, the unions, which have organized the labor and operate that under a union contract, uh, were taking up, what, 70% 70 of the cost yeah. of the budget there in the Mali mm -hmm. hospitals? That's incredible. Yeah. And, and the, what they were able to charge under recent insurance revisions was actually shrinking. Right. So you had costs going up, income coming down, mm -hmm. and they just couldn't survive. And in a normal, a healthy hospital, you want those uh, worker costs to be about 50% or lower. But if you've got a hospital system where it costs 70 percent to just for the workers, then you have a system that's going to fail. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And, and then people began to see the effects of this. Mm -hmm. uh, union workers were being laid off mm -hmm. because clinics were being shut down. Services were being stopped to the most needy in society who require these public hospitals. And uh, it was so bad that uh, you had some friends, Joe, who actually were contributing financially yeah, that's right. out of their own pocket charity to keep a state hospital open. They were contributing hundreds of thousands of dollars just to try to keep the, the hospital afloat of their own personal private money to a public system. In addition to paying the taxes <laughs> that were supposed to, the, to be exactly. going to the hospital anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, there's always this human side. Uh, right. Well, with the human side, too, I've talked to a hospital official who said that um, if there, if the hospital, you know, let's say a lot of people weren't sick that day, so you had a lot of empty beds. Well, they still had to employ, because of the, the union uh, rules, they had to employ at 100%. So you have a system that's being, uh, um, I guess, wa wastefully employed, and you know, where a private system could ramp up and down depending on uh, whether or not people are sick, a public system has to employ the hospitals at 100% capacity at all times, and that's a huge cost too. So the principle here is that our government is doing something that the government is not competent to do. The government is doing something that private industry, when it competes between players, com actually does much better at a lower cost and serving a greater number of people. But mm -hmm. just because of the way we are structured here in the state of Hawaii, we tend to think government should be doing things right. that it's not good at and that it's failing at. Well, and, and across the nation, if you look, a lot of uh, private hospitals are pretty typical. And uh, privately run hospitals or a public-private partnership, they're very typical. That's right. And even in uh, one county, Orange, Orange, Orange county, county, California, they actually went, went and did a, a transfer of all their hospitals to a public-private partnership. And that was quite interesting because Orange County, as a county, went bankrupt. And part of the fix was for them to recognize that there was a better thing than having government run businesses that it wasn't good at. And so, as you mentioned, all of its hospitals in that very ritzy district in California mm -hmm. are now private hospitals run by competing businesses that are doing it far more efficiently and at le less cost to the people. Right. Now, let's kind of zoom ahead a little mm -hmm. bit over here in the story. Uh, you got involved. Uh, you were involved with people who actually saw the homelessness problem increase. The, the poor in society, unable to have their needs met, and a failing hospital system. You got involved when there were a lot of union employees who were very disgruntled by the fact that their jobs were no longer secure. And uh, many people on the island of Maui became activists. Mm -hmm. they, they flew a, and went with us before the legislature uh, in, in the state. And our legislature passed a law. 
Our governor signed it. It went through some court battles. But basically the fact is we are now in the midst of transition. Right, we went through this big fight mm -hmm. and we won. And it, and it all, uh, the, the governor signed the document, we could finally uh, transition to this new model and that would save the hospital system except for one thing. We didn't make uh, the agreements with the unions yet. Okay. And that has been the big snag in this whole process and it's been this delay and delay to finally make a, uh, uh, an agreement with the unions for this to happen. That hasn't happened yet, and because of that, it's going to delay even further. As I understand it from some of the research that is public, as well as some of the private interviews that we've had with key players, we've pretty much passed the point of no return. The, the handoff has been made to Kaiser Hospital, and now Kaiser Hospital is stuck because mm -hmm. they had a deadline of July 2017 by which the state needed to have its act together. That deadline has failed. It's been reset to July of 2017. I'm sorry, it was originally 2016. 16, and now it's now, a year later. A year later, yep. 2017. Mm -hmm. And it looks like uh, that might even be in question because uh, what's going on? How much is this costing Kaiser Hospital? Well, it's costing Kaiser about $500,000 a week, and that's a low estimate. $500,000 a week to try to maintain this sort of uh, hobbling along. That's without, incredible. That, yeah. they, they can't run like that for long. And right. what about the, the hospital staff? Now that they've shut down beds, now that they're closing down services, and, and now I hear that they're functioning pretty much as a clearinghouse, like an emergency room and passing people on to Oahu, what's happening with some of the skilled labor that are, are not employed now? Well, imagine if you were a, uh, a nurse at a hospital that was going through this big process of, um, it, it looks like they're shutting down almost. Imagine if you were a nurse in that system, what would you do? And uh, a lot of the nurses are flying away or they're just getting jobs elsewhere and they're saying, you know, we can't wait for this system to fall apart or, or what, you know, they want to get on with their lives. As you and your team have done their research, what do you think about the prospects of even being able to make the 2017 July deadline with everything together if the state gets the entire act together? Well, it all depends on what happens at the legislature this year. Mm -hmm. So you, you see the union has delayed and delayed, and now it's going to go and delay into the legislative season. So we would predict that th this is going to come up uh, during the legislative session, and um, obviously it might delay and make the whole thing vanish in a puff of That's smoke. That's something. You know, I, I do want to make a note to our viewers that at the Grassroot Institute, we are not opposed to the unions. We believe that there is a noble heritage of rights for workers and the defense of workers that have been fought for by Hawaii's unions, and, and they have been a very important part of coming into the modern age. But like all institutions, they need to evolve. And uh, we care greatly about union workers. And if union negotiations for salaries and work conditions, uh, collective bargaining and so forth don't change, we're going to be in a situation where our hospitals are going to be losing, I mean, are going to actually lose the jobs of union workers, then union workers will be out of jobs. And for the sake of their workers, there needs to be some adjustment. This is a time of, uh, of transition, wouldn't you say? Yeah, well, yeah, to say the least. You know, before we go to a break, Joe, uh, what's the implication? Let's say we see a successful transition of labor from a purely state-run union uh, sector to a public-private partnership with a competitive entity like Kaiser or Hawaii Pacific Health or Adventist or Queens or, or someone with great skill operating that. Other islands are watching. What, what, what's the implication if this is successful? The implication is it could save a lot of lives. Mm. I mean, there are a lot of people on Maui who have to fly now over to Oahu uh, for life-saving procedures. And that time, could, it could be a life and death scenario. So we could actually save people's lives uh, if this uh, transition goes successfully. Well, and that's the bottom line, saving lives of people, touching real human needs. Uh, along with that, keeping a robust economy on the island of Maui, as well as keeping government at the level it should be and not uh, interfering with society by taking on more than it can handle. 
We're going to come back after a short break and we're going to explore some issues such as agriculture on Maui, uh, the water situation and federal laws and how that affects Maui and the rest of the island, as well as the share market such as Airbnb. Well, don't go away. My guest is Vice President of Research at Grassroot, Joe Kent. I'm Kili'i Akina. You're watching a Hanakako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as Senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on ThinkTech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. My guest today is Joe Kent, Vice President of Research at the Institute. Uh, before going on, though, I do want to say thanks so much to Think Tech Hawaii. What a great organization that produces about 30 to 35 hours of original content from downtown Honolulu. You see it right behind me. Uh, downtown Honolulu where we produce that content and it goes all across the world it covers everything from economic issues to social issues to government issues uh, artistic issues just a wonderful coming together of knowledge and you can see all of that work at thinktechhawaii.com you can also visit our programs on grassrootinstitute.org that's grassroot singular institute.org now back to joe we're talking about here today gone to maui well this has been fascinating just talking about how what happens on maui can be an incubator for public policy good public policy all throughout the state and there's an issue that we're very closely involved with it has to do with water mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that's just kind of ironic joe is that on one hand, Maui is just infused with water. It, it is the wettest right. uh, place, or one of the wettest islands around. Uh, mm -hmm. More water than the island of uh, Oahu. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, artesian we springs, wells. You've got the beauty, beauty of... Uh, You've got the West Maui Mountains, some oh. of the rainiest places on Earth. Absolutely. Actually. All and of this still... wonderful rain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's surrounded by water if we had desalination <laughs> yeah. technique. So yeah. my question to you is this, having lived on Maui. Why is everybody on Maui talking about how hard it is to get water on, <laughs> <laughs> on Maui? What's yeah. interfering be between the big supply of water and get, satisfying the thirsts and needs of people as well as agricultural needs, what's in the way? Well, yeah, that's a good question. If you read the paper on Maui every week, it seems like there's always a drought. And you think, well, didn't it just rain? And uh, people just can't get the water. And the reason is because of bureaucracy. In other words, government. Right, government bureaucracy. So the water's there, the people are there, we just can't get the water to the people yeah. because of government. Well, there's more water on Maui than there is on Oahu, but there's way, way less people. And you think, why are so many people thirsty there? And you know, there's a lot of people who have a, a, a plot of land, and uh, for years, for generations, they haven't been able to get hooked up to the water. And the reason is because there was, uh, there's one person in the government who's assigned to, um, to give out these water meters to hook people up to the water. All right. And that, that one person has to deal with 3,000 applications for water. And he gets through about two every month. So if Two a month he, he on gets a list about, of 3,000? Yeah. He this gets is about, longer than the Hawaiian Homes waiting list. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He gets about through about two a month, and he has to do all these applications. Now you think, well, why is it just one guy doing this? And the reason is because there aren't enough public 
uh, engineers to do the paperwork. So, Joe, I, I'm a little incredulous here. I, I can't <laughs> believe if the problem is that simple, mm -hmm. we haven't rep we haven't solved that problem. The problem is that simple. No, and come we on, haven't solved it can't the problem. be. <laughs> and the, so, the county council on Maui, there was they were incre incredulous as well, and they said, "Well, why can't we just get private sector engineers to do the work?" Well, in other words, hire people to yeah. do the work that needs to be done. Exactly. And so? And they said they can't get private sector engineers to do it because of the, a law that prevents private workers from doing work that public workers would have done. Oh my goodness, are you talking about a, a state of Hawaii Supreme Court interpretation that basically says that, that if the government has traditionally been carrying out a certain kind of work, that it would be unlawful to mm -hmm. have the private sector do that, to have the right. government give those contracts to anyone else? It's called the Kono decision, and it says if government has done it, then the private sector can't do it. And that's what's preventing um, the, uh, the water, people getting a drink on Maui. So the, the government doesn't have the people to handle these permits and get people hooked up to the meters for water. And so City Council comes up with this idea that, that, well, let's put out contracts and hire people to do that job for us, or hire another mm -hmm. company right. to do that for us. And they're afraid of a Supreme Court ruling here in Hawaii that says you can't do that. Yeah, and in the meantime, thousands of people wait and continue to wait for generations. Imagine if you had a house and you wanted to pass it on to somebody and that house couldn't get hooked up to the water. Um, it, it, it devalues the land. It makes... Well, you this know, ruling by the court is something worth challenging because, Joe, yeah. in your research across the country, is this a common thing to have a law like this? From our research, this is unique to Hawaii. And oh, well, we're number it, one in something again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if number one or number 50 on this, but yeah, it, it's unique. And why is this uh, um, not challenged in courts? Maybe it should be challenged in courts. Well, you know, if there are any lawyers watching. <laughs> 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 okay, well, you know, that's an issue, but that's not the only water issue on Maui. Right. Maui, as we said earlier, is impacted by things that affect the entire state and how they deal with them could be a model and one of those areas has to be in terms of federal regulation. Uh, we right. now have, we have POTUS, we have SCOTUS, and now we have WOTUS, Waters <laughs> of the United States, the Clean Water Act, which has a broad jurisdiction as well as other acts, acts like the Food Safety Modernization Act and so forth. Federal laws made in Washington DC that affect water supply and agriculture uh, in Hawaii, I mean, how does this Clean Water Act hurt water availability and, and farming right. in, in Maui? Well, the question is, when does the government get to own water? Obviously, the go government has jurisdiction uh, over the oceans, but what about rivers? What about streams? And what about uh, ducks? You know, or uh, uh, irrigation? You know, so how far back up the stream can can the government go? And what the Clean Water Act now is doing is it's it's uh, making it a little ambiguous about how far the government can go up the stream. And that might even include land. So you might have land where water could feasibly uh, run, and does the government then have jurisdiction over that? Now on Maui, we have this uh, sugarcane company that has now gone belly up. Right, HCNS. HCNS, and now that's 36,000 of acres that a lot of people would like to get their hands on, including the government. And so the question is, will the government use the Clean Water Act to go up the ocean, up the river, up the streams to get this land? That's still an open question. Or will, will protesters invoke this federal law? Uh, because doesn't it deal with any bodies of water that enter into, that empty out into American waters? Right. And the, the land that has been vacated by the Hawaii Cane and Sugar, 36,000 acres, is filled with irrigation ditches right. that ultimately in, empty out into Right, waters. well this issue is playing out on Kauai right now. There's a dairy farm mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, dealing with this exact issue and their farm operations could be shut down um, because of this very thing. The so. protesters, I believe, have employed the services of a legal firm called Earth Justice, mm -hmm. which is an advocate for um, environment 
but they're invoking the Clean Water Act. Well, of course, if there is pollution going in the ocean, mm -hmm. of course, that needs to be addressed. But the question is when it's a little ambiguous and when there are other factors at play, such as maybe they want the water and they're just trying to figure out a way to get it. So. Well, that's an issue then that we need to be monitoring very carefully. So what you and your team are doing is looking at these federal laws and seeing what kind of impact they have on Hawaii. Ultimately, what we need is for people to be involved in communicating to their lawmakers. Right. I mean, this is about uh, people have to rise up and try to study this issue. But of course, a lot of these issues are uh, boring. They're buried in uh, large documents, you know, thousands of pages thick. And who's going to want to do that research? Well, Grassroot Institute, that's what we do. Uh, we bury through the research and try to pick out the nuggets that uh, really affect people's lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully that can make a difference. Well, recently, when Hawaii Cane and Sugar shut down, uh, it was announced that that was 78% of all mm -hmm. agriculture right. on the island of Maui. That's incredible. That's huge. And there are great challenges to getting it up and running to become an agricultural land for diversified agriculture. Um, and we wish them well. We were trying to work w with farmers and others to see that that is a solution for that problem. Mm -hmm. But throughout our state, a recent study also shows that agriculture is in serious decline. Right. In fact, so much more that the greatest source or the greatest uh, produ product of agriculture in Hawaii, more than 51 percent, is the seed industry mm -hmm. by, by seed companies such as Monsanto and so forth. But in terms of actual agricultural output as food, it's shrinking tremendously. So what's happening on Maui? Well, right. As, as you know, the gover governor g challenged the state to try to uh, uh, double food production. And on Maui, it's dying. It's sad to say, like you said, 70% uh, is now fallow. And if you look on Maui and you look at the fields uh, where they used to be green, beautiful green fields, now it's just uh, fat as a dust bowl. Now. Has the, the government, in, in issuing this challenge to double food productivity, uh, put out a plan, uh, a strategy as to how that's going to be accomplished? No. In fact, the uh, agriculture department and those who are um, very deep into that uh, industry and sector were totally um, unaware that the governor had this plan. And so he failed to uh, tell the most important um, people in this uh, process. Well, we hope we can be part of the process of solution and I hope that you and your researchers at Grassroot Institute can make some positive contributions to the yeah, future absolutely. of agriculture. Joe, it's been great talking with you great. today. Thank you. And I want to thank you very much for being with us. My guest today, Joe Kent, Vice President of Research at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. And I hope you see that some of the thinking that we do. We're trying to find solutions for the entire state and I hope you'll join us in being committed to Maui and its problems to find greater solutions that will empower everyone in the state of Hawaii as we work together, or as we like to say at the Grassroot Institute, Ehana ka ko, let's work together. Until next week, I'm Kili'i Akina for the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha.